So again, on behalf of ISPG, Indonesian Society of Petroleum Geologists, uh, we are happy to having you here because we can continue our webinar sharing session for. So today's agenda, we gonna talk about introduction to natural fracture modeling. Uh, will be delivered by Masura Dibibo. And on behalf of SPG, I would like to say thanks to all participants who can join uh, this uh, webinar session. And today's talk will be uh, led by Mas Afiliansa uh, as our moderator. So as you know, Mas Afiliansa also uh, the former of FGMI, Forum Geosantes Muda Indonesia, and right now Mas Afiliansa is working in Pertamina Hulu Energy as a geoscientist. And on behalf of ISPG, I would like to say thanks to Mas Surya Dibibowo for your willingness to share the knowledge about natural fracture modeling to the audience here. So without any further ado, I would like to pass on this uh, session to Mas Avaliansa to introduce the speaker and give the rules for this uh, discussion. Please, Mas Avel. Okay, thank you, Mas Julianta. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's an honor for me to, to be a moderator for this webinar sharing session. So, Today we are gonna talk about introduction to natural vector modeling. This topic is uh, very interesting because uh, in the last two years, I think um, many geoscientists uh, discussing about this topic. As we know, uh, yesterday also SKK Migas um, create uh, the webinar sharing session about natural vector modeling. So um, today we can elaborate more with our uh, expertise, Mas Surya Wibowo. He has uh, 18 years experience in oil and gas industry, uh, development and reservoir geologist. Uh, he is also, he started his career in uh, CNOOC, uh, then he moved to Salamander, Paradigm. Uh, he also worked for Abu Dhabi uh, company Petroleum Oil um, and Petronas before he left and now he is a technical director of Adigem, Adigem Consulting. Um, so uh, Mas Suryadi will elaborate more about how we can um, model the natural vector in the subsurface. So Mas Suryadi, time is yours, please. Oh, and also for all the participants, please mute all the speakers uh, so we can discuss uh, more fluently because uh, some of people uh, sometimes forget to mute the speaker. And also we have two sessions of uh, discussion session. So you can chat your question in the chat column. Uh, then we can discuss it later. So, Masuriadi, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Apel, um, and also uh, Julianta. Uh, very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, yeah. Thank you again for ISPG for giving this uh, opportunity for me to give a presentation of the uh, introduction on the natural fracture modeling, uh, which material I shared about the more than a week ago in my LinkedIn. So uh, you can download it from the uh, LinkedIn, uh, uh, which I posted. Um, uh, okay, so we can start with the, 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 the presentations. I'll share my screen. All right. So, Apel, can you confirm that you can see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen clearly. 
All right, so let's begin. This presentation will be started by uh, giving the awareness to all of you that uh, almost all rocks are fractured. Yeah? The, the degree of fracturing might be different from reservoir to reservoir, depending on the magnitude of the structural deformations and also degree of the or rock brittleness. Yeah? And very often, we do not realize that we have a fracture in our reservoir until someday we have a production phenomenon that we cannot explain. Yeah? For example, sometimes we have a well at this its position is at a structurally higher positions, but they undergo a water break too earlier than anticipated. Yeah. This kind of phenomenon is quite common though. And um, the next topic will be on the uh, fracture data acquisitions. That uh, it requires the proper planning so that we can minimize the bias. Uh, the, this bias commonly comes from the acquisition from well because, uh, because of the borehole diameter, which is only 8.5 8 or 12 quarter inch. It's in comparison with the total reservoir volume, it's very, very minuscule. We will also discuss about the fracture origin and fancy classifications and also uh, the fracture identification from subsurface data. But I won't touch uh, too much detail into this, uh, into this uh, topic. And lastly, is uh, how to build a fracture model uh, with two common approach currently, the continuum uh, fracture modeling and discrete fracture uh, network model. Almost all rocks are fractured. Yeah? They always put that in our mind every time we work with the rocks. Uh, fractures occur not only in brittle rocks like uh, basement rocks or uh, carbonates, but it also occur in the softer rocks like porous sandstone. When we see faults, there's always joints or fractures associated with the faults. Uh, the, the bigger the displacement of the faults, the higher the fracture intensity near the fault plane. Fracture presents may enhance or reduce the reservoir properties. Yeah? So when people talking about the fractured reservoir, it's not necessarily about uh, that the permeability will be enhanced, the product, well productivity will be increased, but it can be also the vice versa. I mean, we, the other way around, the reservoir productivity or reservoir permeability will be reduced a lot. So compared to what we see from the core or from logs estimations, the actual vulnerability from well test also happen. Um, the fractures and, uh, and fault stability can also be altered by reservoir pressure change due to productions or due to injections. So our knowledge on the natural fractures is not only define how you optimize the hydrocarbon productions, but also in the safety during the drilling operations. Yeah. The magnitude of the fracture itself is uh, determined by the three, mainly by three points. One is the fracture density. Second is the fracture permeability and the permeability anisotropy. And the third one is the fracture distributions. Fracture presence may increase or reduce our, um, our reservoir quality. Right? So you see on the these two images on the left hand side, a fractured reservoir with open fractures that potentially enhance the properties in terms of porosity and permeability. But this enhancement is not necessarily is enhancement that we want. Sometimes these enhancements, instead of bring uh, oil or gas into our well, it brings water. Sorry, I need to remove that. On the right side, we see a potential reduction because of the 
fracture filling with cementing materials. It, uh, th there might be crystallizations uh, happen inside the fracture. Or in this example, it's a deformation band. A deformation band is a, a thin zones of crust or reorganized grains that forms in, it forms in the porous rocks during the soft de sediment deformations. So it looks like a fracture. In, in fact, it is a fracture, but it's formed during the uh, prior decompactions. So it creates a baffles to our uh, permeability in the reservoir. If you want to do a fracture characterizations, we have to design our data acquisitions to properly image the fractures. Yeah. It started with the, ideally, started with the seismic acquisitions with multi azimuths the seismic processings itself, uh, and then the well data acquisitions with uh, image log and proper well trajectory design to acquire as much fracture data as possible and, and also to avoid the sampling bias. Many fractures are vertical to or normal to bedding, or well, let's say it's a perpendicular to bedding. Yeah. Usually it stops at the bedding boundary so that the, 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 the distribution of the fracture vertically is stopped at the bed boundary. The consequences of this uh, fracture development is that the well deviation becomes an issue when we collect the, the fracture data. Uh, or during the well design to, to, to collect the fracture data. Uh, the practical well is favorable to collect the fracture height data, but the probability or our chance to intersect the fracture is less. So this is one of the main reasons why in our conventional reservoir, we think that we have fractures from our well test of production, but we don't see the fractures. Even though we acquire image logs, but uh, or we plan to acquire data, but the, the since the well trajectory is not in a favor uh, angle to intersect fractures, we rarely see fractures in the in a vertical well or uh, low, uh, in a low angle wells. On the other hand, the, deviated or horizontal well is more likely to intersect fractures. Thus, sometimes the fracture spacing can also be measured. Yeah. I take an example of the fracture that acquisition from wells in this slide. Uh, in this slide huh? um, or to demonstrate, demonstrate the, the bias from the uh, well trajectory. Um, other than that, the seismic data also, also has its own bias, uh, especially related with the acquisitions. For example, the orientations of the, the, the streamer or the, when we design the inline and coastline during the, the acquisitions. We look at these examples. If we drill two wells, one is vertical and the other one is the deviated well, the chance of intersecting fracture in vertical well is very, very small, right? In comparison to the deviated well, where we can get more fractures intersected by the boreholes. In the deviated well case, we can estimate the, the fracture density or fracture spacing from the, from the logs. In this case, image log that we acquire. Another potential of the sampling bias is the presence of the fracture corridor. Uh, well, it's a, in the fracture corridor, we will tend to have a higher fracture intensity compared to the other area. The fracture corridor itself is a, a weak zone where the, a fault slip will likely to occur or if, if it is initiated. In the, in, in the uh, to create faults. So most of the faults started with this uh, fracture corridor. Yeah. Uh, the fracture corridor is also 
commonly developed as a fault related fracture zone. So nearby the, the faults, we usually find these fracture corridors. And away from it, the fracture intensity or the fracture density becomes less. Uh, the wells penetrating this corridor will significantly have upper sampling bias. Uh, um, so that the, the, the data acquisition itself need to, or the, during the interpretation and analysis, we need to take into account that the, the possibility of having this, uh, or penetrating this corridor or not. Uh, one question is that, uh, can we see it from the seismic? Uh, sometimes yes, especially if it is uh, associated with the faults, but uh, it depends on the seismic quality. Sometimes you see the, uh, 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 some attributes, we can see the, the chance uh, of having this corridor. But of course it needs uh, calibration with the well data. I will just touch a little bit on the fracture origin. Uh, there are lots of uh, explanations of this in the literature. Uh, but basically, there are four types of the, uh, or four criteria or classifications of the, the fracture origins. The first one is the, the common one, the tectonic fractures. Included in this group is the fault related fractures, or the fractures that develop in association with the faults. And also the second one is the fault related fractures, which develop during the folding. Uh, the third one, uh, the stylolites, it's uh, classified as tectonic as well, because sometimes it's not only caused by the overburden, but also by uh, tectonic compressions that promote the development of, of vertical stylolites. Uh, the second one is the regional fracture which is uh, a fracture that developed over large area with uh, usually it's a develop due, due to the tectonic uh, loading uh, or part of the basin compaction so it's covered a very large area kilometer scale Number one. you can see it from satellite if it is exposed to in the, in the, in the surface and the third one is the contractional fractures which is uh, fractures that form due to bulk reductions of rock mass. An example of this is desiccations uh, fracture. The common example is mud crack. Yeah. And the second one is a cineresis uh, fracture with the chemical process. A thermal gradient cooling, a thermal gradient, usually because of the cooling of rocks. Example of this is a columnar joint in the igneous rocks. Mineral, and then the last one is the min mineral uh, phase change due to volume productions of uh, uh, mineral. And the last one is the surface related fractures that is formed due to removal of overburden, which uh, release the uh, stress and strain uh, at the rocks. Uh, based on the fracture impact to overall reservoir properties, Nelson in 1985, in his books, classifies the fracture reservoirs into four types. Uh, the type one is the where the when the fractures provide the essential reservoir porosity and permeability. An example of this is the fracture basement. So, in the fracture basement, the both porosity and permeability, or storage and flow, is provided by the fracture. There is no matrix unless uh, sometimes we have a weathered zone at the top of the basement. But the, essentially in the fracture basements, uh, both porosity and permeability is only coming from a, the fracture. And the type, uh, the type two natural fractures is when the fracture provides the essential reservoir permeability. So in this case, the store activity is provided by the matrix. So matrix has the porosity, but does not have sufficient permeability to trigger flow. Um, fracture is required so that the, 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 the fluid inside the matrix can flow. An example of this is like a pipe reservoir uh, or unconventional reservoirs like cell oil or cell gas. Uh, 
uh, the type 3 uh, reservoir, the type 3 fractures, is when the fracture assists permeability in an already producible reservoir. This is a very common case uh, in our conventional reservoir, whether it is sandstone or uh, carbonate reservoir. So our reservoir itself, with its matrix, can also prov can already provide the porosity and permeability. But the presence of the fractures enhance the permeability further so that they, they, they improve the, 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 the reservoir productivity. This is one of the reasons why in the, during the modeling and simulations, we, we, we find that the, our permeability from the model need to be uh, enhanced or need to be multiplied by a number or a factor. Yeah. Uh, one of the rule of thumb is that the, if, it is, if the difference between the permeability uh, well or model and simulation or well test uh, permeability is more than 10, so well test permeability is 10 times, more than 10 times higher than the uh, core permeability or well low permeability, we, it may indicate the fracture presence in the reservoir. And the last one is the type 4 fractures, where the fractures provide no additional porosity or permeability, but instead it creates a significant reservoir as anisotropy or barrier. Yeah. So in, the, the, in, this, in this type 4 fracture reservoir, the fracture itself is usually closed fracture. It's either it is a deformation band or, or, or fracture with mineralizations in the aperture. So it, it's not, it doesn't have any porosity or permeability. So this one is our uh, the bad guy in the reservoir uh, productions. Now we move on to uh, how to identify the fractures. Uh, the easiest way is through core observations or image log. Uh, however, we need a little bit of knowledge on how to distinguish the, the natural fracture and the drilling induced fracture. Yeah. The fracture identification from core is quite straightforward. But the fracture identifications mm -hmm. from the image log is quite tricky sometimes. Uh, first, we need to know the mud system with, uh, during the drilling, whether it was a oil-based mud or water-based mud, and then the type of tool being used, yeah, so that we can uh, distinguish or differentiate the conductive fracture or the resistive fractures or which one is open fracture or which one is the closed fracture. Um, on the image log on the right side, yeah. This one, the middle one is the acoustic image log. And then the right side is the electric image log. Both of them can visualize the fractures. It can, both of them can uh, capture the, the or see the fractures inside the boreholes. What make them what makes them different is the, the quality. The acoustic log resolution is less compared to the electrical image log. Yeah, but it covers uh, 360 degrees of the borehole wall. The electric logs, it depends on the number of paths, but it gives us a crispier image in terms of the, the fracture uh, aperture or the fracture width and also the bedding because these two, these two information will give us uh, uh, will give us data on the what is the aperture size of this uh, fracture and what is the fracture height or potential distributions of this uh, vertical distributions of this fracture. Um, the geometry of the fractures that we can see from the image, it depends on the intersection angle between the borehole and the, the well. So normally in the textbook or in the paper, we see this uh, sinusoidal shape of the fractures. It's because the, 
the well intersect the fractures at an angle. Yeah, let's say 40, 40 degrees or 45 degrees to, to the fractures. When the fracture is vertical and the well, well is also vertical, we will see a vertical image of the fracture. The second one, we can also see the fracture through the during the drilling operations. This is a uh, taken from uh, Henning's publications. When they drill the uh, fracture basement with carbonate uh, reservoir on top of the basement. What's interesting from this uh, this paper is that they we see the fracture indications during the drilling that's shown by the gas kicks, multiple gas kicks happens when they intersect the, 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 the fracture zones. Like for example, this, in this column, we see the, the fracture in, uh, intensity log derived from the image log. So this is the point where they see the fracture intensity, two, three, and four. The highest fracture intensity is in the basement and slightly decrease upward before increase again in the top of the carbonates. Yeah. So what they, they got is the sum of the total loss, the gas kick, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and dynamic losses in, in, the, in the reservoir. So this is the image logs of the, the, the fracture in the basement. A very highly fractured basement. From the seismic, especially the 3D seismic, the fracture distribution orientations can be inferred. We may not be able to see the individual fractures, but we can predict the fracture distributions from the strain depth lot uh, by stress and the associations with uh, larger structures. Uh, for example, we can see fault from the seismic, so and we can ask ourselves whether the fracture is in association with the faults. Well, most of the times the answer is yes, it's, uh, except that uh, how far from the faults and how big the intensity it really depends on the fault types and the, 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 the displacements on the fault itself. Uh, this example is taken from the seismic curvature. In this lower left image, mm -hmm. yeah, we can see that the strains are in this are shown by this positive and negative uh, curvature. A bump, two bumps here, and decline. It uh, suggests a high positive curvature. That may 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 telling us something that the, the this zone is uh, fractured. Other than these uh, three examples on the fracture identification, we can also use a more sophisticated approach like uh, geomechanical analysis to identify the, where the uh, critically stressed uh, faults and fractures or using uh, structural reconstructions. So there are several ways other than these three that I presented here that we can use to, to predict or to estimate the the, the fractures in, inside the reservoir. So, if we have a fracture reservoir, uh, most of the times, ideally, we need to model it. The, the purpose of, of this uh, fracture modeling is served for two purposes. Yeah? So, and, and then it's also dependent whether it is an exploration or development stage. Because uh, one of the, the, the purpose is related to with the well design and drilling operations. By having the fracture model, we can design our well trajectory, uh, whether we want to intersect as many fractures as possible, or we want to avoid it to, to ensure the safety during the drilling. Yeah. So that this will help our uh, driller colleague when they manage the, the mud weight, number of casing, and so on during the drilling. 
The second objective is uh, for optimum uh, for optimum reservoir development and management. We may need to do a dual sim medium simulations to understand the interactions of matrix and fracture. Uh, the fracture reservoir itself can be modeled with different approach. Uh, one, if it is based on the number of medium, whether we want to build a single medium model or dual medium model. We will discuss this uh, in the next slides. And then also based on the modeling technique, whether it is a continuum fracture model or discrete fracture model. Uh, the, the image below is the uh, conceptual uh, changes from realistic reservoir model into a graded fracture model. It's presented by uh, Warren and Root in 1963. We try to, to model a dual medium uh, matrix and fractures in the simulations. So because of this, and we, we, we actually use the same approach. So our, uh, whether we, we use a continuum fracture model or discrete fracture network, at the end of the day, we need to convert them into a grid model. So just like the conventional modeling technique, uh, this fracture modeling also suffers from the model simplifications from the reality into the model. So we need to bear in mind uh, that this simplification occur. So when do we use the single medium or when do we use the dual medium? Uh, this question is particularly important during the flow simulations. Uh, it requires a discussions between the geologists, reservoir engineers, and the other team members to decide what is the best way forward. Yeah. Uh, as, as one of some, some of the guidelines is presented here, uh, the single medium, for example, can be used in the case of uh, we have yeah. like a fracture basement. Yeah. So in this case, we don't have any matrix property, zero metric property. We only have fractures, so it's a, a single medium. And then the the fracture reservoirs, uh, type three fracture reservoirs, where we have the matrix, uh, which is porous and permeable, but the flow exchange between fractures and matrix are fast. So in this case. The, the, the property difference, especially the permeability between the matrix and the fracture, is not really contrast. And the third point is that the, it's almost similar, that the permeability fractures and matrix uh, ratio is quite low. And then the last one, you can use the single medium if it is a single phase uh, reservoir. For example, it's only gas or it's only oil, and it's quite rare. And then we can go into the dual medium when the matrix fracture exchange are non-instantaneous. It means that the, the flow of fluid from the matrix to, to fractures happens, in, happens gradually or not so fast in comparisons with the, the, uh, in, the, in, the in the single medium. And then the, the ratio of the fracture permeability and the metric is high. Um, it's more than high. So if we compare the well test derived permeability compared to the core derived permeability or log derived permeability, the ratio of the well test and the logs is more than 10. And then we have a, the last uh, reason is that we have a flow anisotropy. So the presence of the fractures strongly control the flow anisotropy within the reservoir. The fracturing occurs at a variety of scales. Yeah? Uh, if we, we, we can 
observe the micro fractures, which is micrometer to millimeter in scale, whether we use a uh, thin sections or the uh, like the, the, the scanning a microscope. Yeah. And then there's also intermediate fractures, which scale is in centimeter to meter, which is the most common type of fractures. Uh, this can be seen from the outcrops, from the logs, and also from the core. And then we have large scale fractures, which is a dense decimeter to kilometer scale. It can be seen from the seismic, if it is exposed to the surface, you can see it from the satellite image or from Google Map, Google Earth. Yeah. But the, the one that we can model is limited to the intermediate and large scale in terms of length, especially if we want to build a discrete fracture network. Uh, the micro fracture is way too small to model because if we include too many fractures, the, the, the cost at the computational time will be very expensive. Nevertheless, the, the fracture analysis itself during the process of a analysis, all of this skill must be evaluated. And we must include all of them during the observations and the interpretations. And then later when we try to estimate the distributions for aperture or uh, fracture length, we actually suggested or recommended to develop a Murphy scale analysis to derive uh, the fracture distributions. in terms of aperture and length. This is a fracture modeling workflow presented in SPE Forum 2010 by Nelson. Um, the fracture model is obtained through the integration of static uh, descriptions and dynamic description. Yeah. The static description consists of the evaluation of subsurface data, such as image log, seismic, and also from the outcrops while the dynamic observations is defined from the well test and production uh, data analysis. So you can derive a dynamic conceptual model, you can derive a static conceptual model. Both of them are combined. In this term, it's, uh, in, in this, in this uh, workflow, it's termed as an upscaling. And we can choose two paths, whether we want to model it using the discrete network modeling, or we want to model it as a continuous uh, fracture model. So, uh, before we go into discussing into this uh, continuous fracture model, if you have any questions, uh, just put on the chat. I think later on, Apple will. Uh, will, will Tell me uh, the questions. Okay, um, for everyone who have uh, some question about uh, the introduction for fracture itself um, from the material that presented by Masur uh, Suryadi before, uh, just give your question in the chat column, then we can discuss, discuss it with Mas Suryadi. Okay, Mas Suryadi, um, the question from Ronald Siregar. Mm -hmm. Is there any hostile imaging tools technology, uh, <coughs> borehole temperature uh, to 100 degrees Celsius, available either uh, wireline or uh, logging while drilling tools? Uh, I'm not aware about the tools that can withstand that kind of temperatures, but maybe we can discuss with the uh, our colleague in the geothermal because they are dealing with such kind of temperature. So very sorry, I'm not. Uh, I cannot answer that question. Uh, okay. Um, Masuriadi, uh, maybe I have uh, some quick question for you. For you, um, most people evaluate tectonic fracture related. Uh, I have a question. What about contractional fracture? such as columnar joint uh, fracture potential, maybe? Uh, 
since in Indonesia we have many volcanic intrusion, maybe it can be a potential for uh, evaluate more about uh, contraction of actual potential. Uh, if we are talking about that, actually there are plenty of examples, not in Indonesia, but they, um, I think in the Venezuela, there are some. Oh. Um, yeah, they they in one of the reservoir, one of the field, they produce from uh, seal intrusion. Oh. So this seal intrusion is fractured uh, during the cooling process. So it creates a fractures similar to the columnar joints and they drill horizontal wells to develop these uh, fractures. Um, cannot remember the, 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 the paper title but yes I, I, I read that once. Okay so uh, it has been proven in Venezuela that uh, yes. seal intrusion can also be a potential reservoir. Right? Yes. Okay uh, there's also a question from Bourega how to calculate the number of fractures? How to calculate number of fractures? Um, it's, we need to use the image law. The, 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 so we digitize it manually yeah, using the image law. And we, we just uh, estimate the, just put down the number of fractures. So we create, uh, with, it's like a normal law. So it's depth versus number of log, uh, number of fractures, right? But this later on need to be converted. Uh, we need to upscale it to convert it into fracture intensity. So it will be, uh, I think in most software, or you can do it in Excel, we can create an interval, let's say five meters, how many fractures in that five meters? Then so carry on with the, the next interval. Uh, that's how you calculate the, the fracture numbers. Uh, we will discuss that later in the in the in the in the this discrete factor network because this approach uh, is used in the VFN. Okay, so um, the solution is we have to uh, get uh, image log data to calculate number of fracture. You must say. Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately yes. Um, you can also use the oriented core, so you know the the orientation of the core. And similarly to the image log, you can also uh, count the number of fractures along the world. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question from Maulana Hidayat. Could you repeat again about how to determine nature fracture and fracture because of drilling process? Okay. You can go back to that slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, during the drilling, it's we sometimes we, we observe the, 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 the gas kick, right? And also the low circulations. Uh, even when we do not drill a fractured reservoir, we are not aware of the fractured reservoir. We instantaneously relate that, that there are some things that might be um, might, might be in, in, in relationship with the fracture presence or with the uh, very high permeability or very high porosity zones. And then we can compare it with the, 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 the reservoirs or the rocks that will be in trail. Uh, what's the chance of having high perm zones or what's the chance of having fractures? So this is still qualitative, but it's, uh, but it's give us an indication or at least an idea of what we may have during the trail. So it's uh, the fracture indicators is coming from the, 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 the gas kick or the, the, the total loss, the dynamic loss that we, we encountered during the drilling. And then later on, we, to make it uh, quantitative, we can compare it with the image log or, with the, or the, the, the fracture intensity or the fracture uh, density calculated from the image log. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe. Uh by reading the image log data, how we can determine the natural fracture uh, with mechanical induced fracture, maybe Mas uh, Suryadi can elaborate more. Oh, the, you mean the how to distinguish the uh, drilling induced fracture and the natural fractures, right? Yes, yes. I, very sorry, I did not put it here, but uh, it's actually quite clear. The 
the drilling instructors usually comes in pair and they are vertical and they are in opposite direction. So if I go to this, uh, take these examples, yeah, uh, usually you can see like a conductive fractures vertically, black color, yeah, and it's in opposite directions, 180 degrees. So if you see it here, you will see it in the next 100, uh, 180 degrees here, vertical. So they are in opposite directions. Okay. That's uh, the easiest way and the common uh, drilling industry structure that you can see. Uh, in the core, it's, it depends on the, uh, what caused the, the, the drilling industry structure. So, and I don't have the image here, so we cannot explain it. But, uh, but I believe you can search in your literature. There are plenty of uh, publications on that. Okay, I think uh, that's the answer for Maulana Hidayat. Uh, the next question, oh, so, so many questions. Uh, from piece is, is image lock or core better for determining natural fractures? Maybe, yeah. uh, uh, which better, image lock or core? The question is that. Which better? For, yeah, for determining natural fracture. In terms of uh, operation, cost, I think image lock is better. But you have to design, yeah. You have you have to design properly. Discuss it with your drilling engineers properly, because uh, what mat, what 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 system that you will use. So it's uh, the point is that the a proper planning, and also it's not only about the that mat system, but also on the well trajectory. Uh, where can we uh, or which directions or at what uh, what angle we can obtain uh, as many fractures as possible. Okay, so and for the interval also, image lock can cover all the interval from well section. Eh? Exactly. Um, next question from Shafiq. In your opinion, which seismic attribute or method or technique that can be detect fracture clearly? Well, we will discuss it uh, later. Okay, so <laughs> we, we can continue to the next question. Shafiq, uh, the answer will be in the next slide. Um, do the fracture ones of structure trap? Do the fracture one of structure trap? Maybe uh, mass econor means uh, it is uh, part of structural trap in the petroleum system aspect. It's not a uh, structural trap. It cannot be a structural trap. In fact, it requires a. Um, uh, six seal locks or shell to ensure that the, the fluid does not migrate upward. Yeah. It is part of porosity and permeability aspect for reservoir uh, term. Yeah? Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, the next question from Sudar Moyo. How to determine of permeability ratio? Wow, this is interesting. In dynamic uh, fracture model, how to determine permeability ratio in dynamic fracture model. How to determine the... Now, it's... Uh, if it is... The, if if, if the, 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 the question is about uh, how can we estimate what is the fracture permeability uh, contributed by the fractures and what is the uh, permeability contributed by the matrix mm. from the model, the answer is quite uh, difficult, but I think it's doable. But uh, if the answer is the, the, the total permeability from well test, that, uh, that, uh, and, then, then, and then it's uh, compared with the matrix permeability from logs or from core, that is normal. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a, from the, the well test, we can derive the permeability thickness compared to the, the thickness of the reservoirs, and then we can get the permeability from the fractures, plus metrics, of course. And that's the ratio. So that's uh, the ratio between the well test and the, uh, the, the, the core or the logs give us a, uh, uh, an idea whether we have a fracture reservoir or not. So sometimes the well test does not really show that we have a fracture uh, behavior in the direct effective plot of the PTA. Uh, 
but the, by looking at the uh, the ratio of the probability between well test and the, the logs or core, it suggests us that we may have fractures. Okay, so uh, I want to elaborate more for this question, Ma Suryadi. You said that if we have 10 times bigger permeability uh, from well test than we have calculated by log, assume it came from uh, fracture. So, uh, but what if uh, we have carbonate reservoir because uh, high permeability maybe also come from uh, dissolution porosity? Yeah, that's a that's the, the, the challenge in the carbonates. Uh, sometimes the the the, 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 sol the solutions or the pagi porosity from the carbonates, especially the connected ones, also give similar behavior with the fracture. So most of the time it confuses us, um, but that's the nature. So that's why our uh, reservoir engineer colleague usually when it deals with carbonate and see the high perm. Uh, observe from the well test in comparison with the logs, they immediately, immediately say that we have fractures, but maybe it's not fractures, it's just a, a dissolution or buggy porosity inside the, the reservoir. Okay, so yeah, it's possible also from dissolution porosity, right? Yes. Okay, um, the next question, Mas Uriyadi. Um How we can manage confidence the fracture before drill? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat again the question? Okay, uh, maybe uh, Mas Lutfi means uh, how can we confidence with the fracture occurrence in the subsurface before we plan to drill the uh, target? All right, so just like uh, standard evaluations when we deal with the conventional reservoirs, we can use the analogs, right? analogs of the surrounding uh, fields. Yeah. Do they have a fracture itself or not? Yeah. That's one. The second is the, the seismic. The seismic is the very valuable data to, 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 to inform us, uh, to, to, to tell us whether we have a fracture itself or not. Uh, of course, what we can see from the seismic still need to be calibrated, but uh, using the Common uh, seismic attributes, for example, like the curvature or the coherence or the variance or n strikes in material. Uh, we, can, we can already get an indication uh, we may have fractures in the reservoirs before we drill it. Okay, um, okay. I think we should move on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for, for the other question, we will, we will discuss it later because. Yeah. Uh, we will next uh, our uh, presentation from Masuriadi. So Masuriadi, uh, you can continue your presentation. Thank you. Uh, we will keep your questions. Uh, we, I will answer it later on. Uh, all right. So we have just uh, last uh, the last slide that I presented was about the, the fracture modeling workflow. So we have two common approach. One is the discrete modeling, and the second one is the continuum modeling. Uh, the oldest one is the, the continuum fracture modeling. Uh, it's it's uh, started with uh, by, by Warren and Roach in 1963, but it's still evolving until now, and people are still using it until now. And it's also uh, has its own merits, has its own strength, despite its weakness. Um, the, in the continuum fracture modeling, we separate also the, the, the metrics and fractures. So it is a dual porosity, dual permeability. Yeah? Uh, but this fracture is trying to uh, model all the fractures of any origin, any orientations in one model. So regardless of the, the fracture orientations, regardless of the, 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 the timing, it tries to combine all of them into one. So it focuses only on the factors that control where the fracture occurs, but not the detail of the fracture itself. So it's trying, in other words, it's trying to focus what's the, the, the implication of having fractures to the fluid flow or to the or during the simulations. Uh, instead of uh, uh, spend times in the evaluating 
each fractures or each fracture set, uh, it focuses on the jump into the, 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 what matters into the fluid flow, which is fracture properties, the fracture porosity, the fracture permeability, and the, the saturations, right? Um, in this uh, CFM, uh, fractures are modeled by integrating all scales informations. So it's basically an integrated approach. It's, it's also combined the informations or the interpretations from core, log, and the seismic into a single fracture intensity model. Yeah. And then this fracture intensity model later on can be uh, correlated to the fracture porosity or the fracture permeability uh, to, 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 to derive the, the fracture properties. Um, the main objective of the continuum fracture model is to model the fracture distributions. Uh, the idea is uh, still the same with the DFN, for example. It's still derived using the conceptual geology. Yeah. So the CFNs are also derived from the uh, possible fracture distributions uh, in the reservoir. It's, uh, what's the relationship of the, the fracture presence with the lithology? What's the relationship with the, the porosity, bed thickness, distance to fault or distance to fault hint? And it, since it is an integrated approach, it's also used in a 2D or 3D seismic analysis. Yeah? We can also use the, 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 the inversions or the acoustic impedance or the, 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 uh, the attributes or multi attributes that we can, uh, can, we can get from the seismic. Um, from the seismic, we can get the multiple fracture indicators. So maybe one, one attribute is not enough, or um, we try to get a multi-attribute uh, combined from several attributes. Uh, and we can use the, uh, the statistical method or neural networks or machine learning, whatever methods are available, uh, to, to generate the, the, the fracture properties or fracture uh, intensity. Uh, this is the workflow examples of the CFM published by Jenkins in 2009. Uh, the seismic data, um, as usual, is used to generate the interpretations, the attributes, the inversion as well as time depth conversion. Uh, and then the well data uh, is used to gather information of the, about the fractures. We can derive the uh, what is the bed thickness, what is the lithology, what is the porosity, and then the fracture uh, intensity from logs or fracture uh, uh, density from logs. And then we, we can also have a, a geomechanical mechanical model constrained with the seismic and the well log data uh, to be used along with the, these two. To, 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 to identify the fracture, to, to, to generate the fracture model. These three aspects are combined with the artificial intelligence tool in this, in this, in this uh, workflow. Uh, we can use uh, another statistical methods or neural networks or a machine learning to generate a single uh, or, or stochastic 3D fracture density distributions. Yeah. These fracture density distributions can also later on be used to derive the, the fracture properties like uh, porosity, permeability, and so on. Another workflow is uh, or approach is to directly relate the fracture properties uh, from the, the, the multi-attributes analysis and well data. So we have a um, uh, fracture indicator uh, seismic attributes, like uh, acoustic impedance, uh, maximum curvature, uh, spectral imaging. And then we also have the fracture uh, intensity from well data, combined with the neural networks or machine learning. Uh, we do the analysis based on groupings, for example. So similar with the, the, the conventional reservoirs, we, do it on zone. Or in this case, we name it mechanical stratigraphy, or we can uh, evaluate it based on the lithophases or depophases. 
Yeah. And then from this, uh, whether it is a, a, a trained model or an unconstrained model, you can derive the fracture porosity or fracture permeability in these examples. This is uh, uh, the, the one of the workflow published by Owenis. Now, the second one, so that, that uh, CFM, or Continuum Fracture Modeling, it's just, just like that. I mean, it's very simple. If we, what, what if we do not have the, the seismic, we only have uh, well data, then it's, we can only use the, 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 our geological concepts, right? Same, uh, I mean, this geological concept is applies everywhere. Uh, similarly, in the FN, if we, if we do not have the size, we can also use the geological concepts, like uh, this tends to uh, this tends to faults or this tends to um, uh, fault hing, for example. Um, so it's very much the same. What makes the difference is that in in the in the discrete fracture networks, the fracture is presented or displayed or visualized in in the planar objects. So. The term DFN itself is actually has been used since uh, early 80s. Yeah? Uh, people or the, 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 the scientists, especially in the groundwater studies, already uh, start using the, the discrete fractures it's because, because they think that the, the, the continuum fracture model is geologically not really realistic. Right? So they want to use the, something that is geologically more representative. So that's why the, the, the DFN is uh, used. Um, so the first bullet introduced by Dersowitz in 1998, it might not be entirely correct, but that's the time when, uh, when Dersowitz and his colleague uh, able to transform the, the, the discrete planar uh, fractures into 3D grid, or what we know now as the fracture upscaling. So transforming the, the planar objects into 3D grids. So the DFN is the mathematical representation of fracture system in 3D geometry. Uh, in this model, the fractures model as planar objects. The, so we need to define the orientations, the, the size, and also its distributions in space. Um, every fracture set has individual properties. Yeah. So every fracture, uh, every fracture sets or fracture group has all its own orientation, has its own size, has its own uh, uh, aperture width, has its own distributions. Uh, and and uh, that's why the DFN is very much a geologically driven fracture model and able to generate a geologically realistic model. Um, one of the uh, drawback or the requirement of this uh, DFN, it requires a thorough understanding of fracture system in the reservoir. Uh, in other words, it is very data intensive and very time consuming. So um, in the next slides, you will see how rigorous uh, uh, fracture data characterizations and interpretation required to generate a DFN in comparison to the CFM, which is only a few slides in these presentations. Yeah. So this is the DFN modeling workflow. So we start with the similar fracture characterizations. We use uh, oriented core, we use the image log, we can, only, we can also have a uh, outcrop analogs and the, 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 the seismic interpretations of the, the fractures. And then, <clears throat> From this uh, information, we, 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 we derive the information about the fracture aperture. What, what are they? We, uh, we will discuss uh, shortly. The fracture geometry in terms of length and width, uh, length and height, sorry. And then the fracture orientations, and then the fracture intensity. Uh, the seismic, this is might not be correct, but this is supposed to be the, the fracture driver that can also be derived from the seismic or from the geological concepts. Uh, um, by, by, by combining the, the, the fracture driver and these uh, properties, we can generate the DFN into the model. 
but this DFN cannot be used in the simulation. So we need to upscale it uh, into properties. We need to transform the planar objects into grids, which for some geologists it's like a nightmare, but that's how it works. So by doing upscaling, we can get the porosity, permeability, and this is sigma or set factor. Right. Um, the DFN modeling requires a set of fracture analysis from the integrations of core, log, seismic, and the geological interpretations. Uh, we need this, uh, this uh, list of information to be able to model the DFN. So the first one is the fracture sets and orientations. Uh, so we need to know the, the fracture dip, dip azimuth, and its concentrations. And then the, the fracture width or aperture, the fracture length, the fracture height, or the elongation ratio, or the ratio between the length and the height. And then we need to define the mechanical stratigraphy. Uh, this, this is also actually used in the continuum fracture modeling. And then we need uh, information of the fracture distribution or fracture driver, which can be derived from the seismic or from the conceptual geology. <coughs> um, the, once we get the, 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 the fracture uh, network model, then we can upscale it to create the fracture porosity, permeability, and sigma, or set factor. Uh, this is the figure from NAR in 1996, only to show you how the, the, those fracture parameters look like. So we have the, the fracture length that indicates the, uh, the length of the fracture in space, the height uh, shown by this, and then the spacing is the distance between uh, the fracture in, uh, in, in uh, one horizontal or uh, one lines. Yeah. We also have the aperture shown by A here, A1, A2, A3. Um, and those are the informations that uh, we need to, to get from our uh, data. Um, from these visualizations, you can also see that the, the, the borehole in comparison to the fractures. So there are effects of uh, or a, a bias or uncertainty because of the borehole size in comparison to the fracture. So um, this is what contributes the, to the, the, the fracture uncertainty uh, analysis, especially on the uh, the, the fracture intensity from well logs, because uh, the bias of the borehole size in comparison to the, the fracture distributions and the fracture size itself, it's, uh, it's very un highly uncertain. So we go to the, uh, the first fracture sets. Uh, the first one is the, the, the fracture sets and orientations. Um, the, the fracture set is a group of fractures. Yeah? So from so many fracture data, we try to group them into several uh, sets. Yeah. Um, most of the time, this, this set is defined using the fracture, uh, fracture uh, orientations. Yeah. So it's defined by the fracture deep and deep azimuth. How to do that? They, one, of, one of the method is by plotting the, the Ross diagram and plot it on the maps like this to see what the relationship between the, the fracture orientations, the majority fracture orientations and the, and the, 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 the structure in, in, in our uh, reservoir. So we can see, for example, in this uh, map, uh, uh, the northeast, uh, northeast southwest uh, fractures quite dominant in this area. It might be uh, one family with these folds and these folds, but there's also another uh, fracture sets with the, uh, with uh, northwest southeast directions, which might be in when in the same uh, groups or in association with these folds. Similarly, if we go into this uh, closer or this closer, uh, we will see that the 
the fracture orientations uh, as shown by this rose diagram is very much aligned with the the the, the lineament from the the, the faults. Uh, other than the orientations, uh, can also define the the fracture sets based on its origin. So we may have a different uh, tectonic events that creates uh, different uh, the fractures. Uh, but in the case when the, the fracture direction is the same or the orientation is the same, it's very difficult to, to, to distinguish or to, to define which one, which fracture sets comes from the, uh, which tectonic events. So it's almost uh, impossible to do that. Um, uh, another one is the time of development. So unless it's uh, uh, tied to uh, mechanical stratigraphy, for example, the, the lower reservoir has different, uh, may, may have different fracture sets compared to the uh, above reservoir. That we can, we, can, we, can, we can do that. And then they based on the fracture scale, but this is uh, very uncommon because uh, the, the current trend is to use a multi-scale uh, analysis. The, the meaning of the multi-scale analysis is by combining the, the fractures information from uh, different measurement tools, from core seismic or even uh, SEM protein sections into one. Uh, one uh, examples of uh, how to define the fracture set. So this is an outcrop uh, picture. Uh, this fracture has three fracture sets. Yeah, these uh, these outcrops. Uh, the first one is the we have two conjugate shear uh, presented by blue and yellow color in these directions. Uh, let's say it is a uh, not relatively north and uh, south directions. The other one is the yellow, which is uh, north west south east, and one extensional fracture represented by red. So in this case, we have three fracture sets or three fracture groups that need to be evaluated uh, one by one. If we if visualize it on the Ross diagram, we will see three different uh, scatter or two different uh, graph of these uh, three fracture sets. So one, two, and three. Uh, it, but in the subsurface, the the image log is our tool to our main tool to identify the, the fracture deep and deep azimuth. Uh, if we have a oriented core, that also will be a valuable source of data. Um, again, we need to distinguish the natural fractures uh, from the drilling induced fractures. So we, we only analyze the, the, the natural fractures, not the, the drilling induced. So similarly, with the, uh, in, in the, in the outcrops, we create the ROS diagrams or to identify what are the, the potential uh, number of fracture sets or number of the uh, major orientations, yeah? how many possible uh, groups that we can get from, the, from our fractures. Uh, the, the evaluation can be done, we need to do, to do it uh, step by step. Maybe the first step we want to uh, separate it based, based on the uh, zones, the zone of the reservoirs or the formations or whatever that you think it's, uh, it will give a clear distinctions of the, uh, the fracture sets. So the second parameter uh, is the fracture width and aperture. Yeah. The, the fracture aperture is defined as the perpendicular distance separating the fracture walls. So we also call it as a kinematic aperture. Uh, while the fracture width, it's uh, generally refers to the distance of open space. So the fracture aperture is the, the this distance between the wall 
but sometimes this filled with the mineral or with crystals. So the 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 effective width is sometimes it's less than the fracture aperture. Yeah. But uh, in the literature we use we 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 use the aperture and width interchangeably. So just bear in mind that the sometimes when people say it's aperture, it's actually fracture width. The, the, the fracture width can also increase by the dissolution of fracture walls. That's very common in carbonates. So the dissolutions may increase the, the fracture width, improve the permeability, but it can also decrease due to mineral precipitations on the fracture walls. Yeah? Um, if we take it collectively from uh, micro to outcrop uh, scale, the aperture size can vary from one micrometer to uh, one meter. But in the subsurface, it's generally only a few microns to millimeter scale. Yeah? Uh, you won't see the one meter uh, fracture aperture in the subsurface because of the, the it, if we have such large fracture, it will be filled by the, 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 the sediments above. So this is the um, one example. What's the difference between the fracture aperture and the, the, the fracture width? So the red arrow tells us about the, the fracture aperture, the metal aperture. But this aperture has been filled by the, the minerals inside it. So the effective uh, fracture width is actually zero. So we don't have the we don't have the, the any porosity or any probability in this fracture. Now, um, back again to the image log. This is where, what I think mm -hmm. is the, the most reliable uh, fracture width measurements come from. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, even though it is regarded as one of the best uh, tool to identify the fracture aperture, the, the, the uncertainty is very high. Yeah, because it's, it, it depends on how deep the mud, the drilling mud, uh, penetrated into the fracture. Yeah. And also the, the resistivity, con resistivity contrast of the mud and the background reservoir. So, for example, uh, if we have one millimeter fracture with the uncertainty in the interpretations of the width is actually plus minus 50%. So imagine that the, uh, the, 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 the such big uncertainty when we estimate the fracture aperture. Uh, how about the core? Uh, well, the fracture width measurement from core is actually worse because the, the core suffers the relaxation effect. Uh, when we take the core out of the subsurface, the, the overburden release creates a, from a relaxation of the core. So the, the, there's a very high chance that the aperture already increased from what it should be. And also sometimes it's broken. Uh, if we have the highly fractured uh, reservoirs, so it, make, it makes the aperture measurements from core very difficult. Um, so some people, use an um, empirical approach uh, using correlations of fracture uh, width or fracture aperture with length. Yeah. Uh, they, they demonstrated that there is a, a correlations between the uh, fracture width and fracture length. But in my opinion, we must be very careful because they, the fracture aperture is also affected by the uh, far field stress or the earth stress. Right? So uh, different orientations or different uh, fracture uh, deep and deep azimuth in, 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 uh, to the horizontal stress may have a different um, impact to the fracture aperture or fracture width. And also the geological process 
after the factor development, such as mineralizations, compactions, uh, and so on, it's cannot be cannot be. Uh, I mean, uh, we cannot underestimate this uh, impact to the factor aperture. So, in 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 in. In, in, in my opinion, the correlation between length and fracture is, is actually not a straightforward uh, approach. So we need to be very careful with that. But uh, there's, there is uh, uh, such approach and also in the, some software. So you will find it that the, the, the software requires you to put the uh, fracture aperture as a function of uh, fracture length. Um, the fracture aperture uh, and also the other uh, fracture properties very very common. It follows the power law distributions. Uh, the power law distribution is a it will if we plot the uh, the fracture properties in this case uh, fracture uh, kinematic aperture uh, versus in the y axis the the cumulative uh, distribution of cumulative frequency, it will, in the log-log plot, it will give us a, a, a straight line. That's what we call as the, the, the power law. Um, and this power law um, happens to any scale of the properties. So in this uh, image, in this picture, published by Mare uh, in 1999, uh, there are two uh, data that used to 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 to, to get the fracture aperture. Um, initially, he used the micro fracture information from SEM. Uh, sorry, the 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 uh, yeah. <clears throat> they, uh, sorry, they used the, the micro fractures uh, from the the, uh, the 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 hand specimen using the, the, the magnificent lens in the shown in the purple the dots there. And then uh, compare it with the uh, microfractures identified from the SAM. So um, it forms a straight line in the, in, in, in the log log plot of the aperture and the cumulative frequency. Uh, you will also see these uh, same plots uh, when we talking about the fracture length. The next parameter is the fracture uh, height and length. Uh, the fracture shape is thought as an ellipse in nature, uh, but the, due to the computational difficulty, it's modeled as rectangular shape with four sides, but sometimes you can put uh, six sides to try to mimic the, 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 the ellipse shape. Um, the elongation ratio is defined as the ratio of length over height. Uh. So this is the fracture length. And this is the fracture height. So how to measure the fracture height? Um, one of the clue in the fracture reservoir is that the, the practical propagation of fracture is commonly, commonly halted at the bed boundary. So it stopped at the bed, uh, bed boundary. Yeah. So one bed has one bed thickness, very common needs. Uh, same with the, the, the fracture height. Yeah. But in crystalline rocks like uh, metamorphic or igneous rocks, uh, the boundary can be a metamorphose uh, stratigraphic boundaries or features like uh, dikes or seals. Uh, this is uh, the examples. So on the left hand side is the, the, the sedimentary rocks. So the fracture uh, height is equal with the bed thickness. So you can see that the, this, these fractures stop at the bed boundary. So it does not propagate, exit the boundary. Well, some of them, yes, uh, but in majority, it's usually stopped at the, uh, at, at, at the bed boundary. So, and there's also a correlation between the uh, bed thickness and the, the fractures uh, intensity that we will discuss later. How about the uh, crystalline uh, rocks? This is a 
a seal, yeah, a fractal seal, uh, where you can get the uh, the fractal height is equal as the uh, seal thickness. All right. So now the fractal length. Uh, the fractal length is, is usually the easiest way is we, we estimate it from the, the seismic. So um, uh, we, we take the big, big, uh, big features of the faulting, of the faults that we can, uh, or minimum that we observe from the seismic. We measure the lengths. Um, analog from the outcrops that we, we, or, or satellite image can also be used. Yeah. And then the and another tools to measure the fracture uh, length is uh, using the uh, image log, but it's it suffers on the because of the uh, resolution issue, uh, what we call as a truncations or uh, sorry sensoring because they, the the fracture length may exceed the core size, the core width. So similar with the fracture aperture, when we plot the, the fracture length and the cumulative uh, distributions in a log log plot, we see that the multi-scale of the different data form a, plot, uh, form a straight line. This is what we call as the power law scaling. So we, with the information from the seismic, we can estimate what would be our fracture length in the smaller scale. Uh, that's the idea of the power law scaling. Of course, with uncertainty, and uh, ideally, we have uh, verifications that we can derive uh, from another data. <clears throat> so, um, the, 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 the fracture modeling requires us to constrain the fracture distributions, not only based on the, the fracture drivers, but also based on the zonations. So the zonations in the fracture modeling, it depends on the mechanical stratigraphy. That is the, the what is the mechanical stratigraphy? The mechanical stratigraphy divides the rocks into discrete mechanical units, defined by the uh, rock properties, such as a tensile strength, uh, brittleness, or uh, another like a young modulus poison ratio, etc. Um, the mechanical stratigraphy affect the structural developments, including the fracture style, dimensions, distributions, and also the mechanics. Yeah, and the the mechanical stratigraphy, um, one of the uh, how we, we we identify the mechanical stratigraphy is by relate that to the lithology. Uh, relate that with the uh, tectonic history on or the pressure temperature conditions. Um, the simple examples is uh, in, of the mechanical stratigraphy is the joints in or fractures in bedded lithology are often restricted to bed boundary. Like uh, I explained before that the, the fractures usually stop at the bed boundary. So that forms a, a micro mechanical stratigraphy. But if we take bed to bed, it's very detailed, right? So we need to group them uh, into a, a more workable uh, zones during the modeling. So the mechanical unit or the mechanical stratigraphy uh, for each zone or each unit, it may include several different uh, lithology, but with similar uh, mechanical properties. Um, so the mechanical unit thickness, it's often controlled the joint shape and the joint spacing. Uh, joint is similar with the fractures, yeah. And also it's often, very often, it's proportional to bed thickness. Um, the fracture characterizations for each fracture set should be carried on on each uh, mechanical strata. So some, uh, well, rule of thumb, 
in or guidelines in defining mechanical static gravity. You can see it in the next slides. Uh, this is the from Stearns and Friedman that the different lithology because of their uh, brittleness, mechanical properties, may have different uh, number of fractures. For example, we have a quartzite. It's very brittle, so the number of the fractures or the fracture intensity is very high. With uh, compared to the dolomite, the second one. Uh, quartz sandstone, calcite cemented sandstone, and limestone, which is the, the least fracture. Of course, this is not a, uh, not a hard uh, information. I mean, this is just uh, what, what they observe. In our own reservoir, it might be different, right? So we need to adjust it with uh, conditions in our own reservoirs. And then the bad thickness controls. We know that they they, the, the fractures normally stop at the bed boundary. You can also see in the same pictures here. Um, but the fracture spacing increase as the bed thickness increase. So it means that they, the thicker the bed, the lesser fracture that we can get. Yeah? So in this plot, you can see that they, if the bed thickness uh, the, if the bed thickness increase, the fracture spacing is also increased. The fracture spacing means the, the distance between fractures. So the distance between uh, fractures uh, increase as the, the thickness increase. So less fractures in the, in the thicker bed. So this is examples of uh, how we define the mechanical stratigraphy. So, for example, uh, the, the, the original uh, stratigraphy defined from core mm -hmm. includes uh, several uh, depositional environments. But in the mechanical stratigraphy, now it, it, it's only two. So, these blue, uh, blue middle surfaces is gone. It's combined with this one. So, this is the zonations that will be used during the, 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 uh, the fracture propagations. This is another example from uh, Bechow fields, how they define the, the mechanical stratigraphy. So the top one is the zone one, high porosity, high permeability, the zone two is medium uh, porosity, medium permeability, and then the zone three, which is uh, low porosity and low permeability. So from this, we, they, they, they already define that they, uh, the, the, the fracture intensity or in this uh, lower zone will be much less compared to the fracture intensity at the top. Right. So the next parameter is the, the fracture distributions. Right. So the, the terminology used in the fracture distributions is very confusing, especially in the literature. So sometimes people use the fracture spacing, uh, fracture frequency, fracture density, fracture intensity uh, in, interchangeably. Uh, I, I also have to admit that I use them, uh, I mix them a lot. So you will hear me talking about fracture density, fracture intensity. It's just happened uh, unconsciously. Um, and then even in the, uh, Malden and Dershowitz in the thousand proposed the fracture abundance, so another terms uh, that they, they, they propose because it is a scale independent. The, the terminology covers the fracture density, intensity, and the porosity. It defines in 1D, 2D, and 3D. So it's based on this work by, uh, by Dershowitz and Herda in 92. In this diagram, uh, the numbers refers to the, the um, uh, measurements uh, unit. So zero refers to uh, point measurements or, or number of fractures. Yeah? Zero is number of fractures. One is fracture length. Two is fracture area. And three is the fracture volume. While the P is stands for the persistence. 
So um, in the 3D fracture modeling, uh, the fracture distribution will be defined from the volume measurements. Right? So because we are talking about 3D, it's volumes. So the one that we use is P30 or P30, P31 and P32. Um, <clears throat> but the, the fracture intensity from well, uh, from well is P10. Usually P10 because we, we calculate number of fractures along the wall hole using the image law. Um, over one over over the interval, and then uh, it's, it, it is actually a P10. So number of fractures intersect per line. So we assume that the borehole is uh, lined. Uh, so along the lines, uh, the number of fractures for a given interval, let's say every five meters or, or one meter, is, 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 is calculated or counted from the image log or core. Right? Um, in the modeling, what we use is these three things, P30, P31, P32. Right? The most common one is P32. P32. So we need to um, convert the P10 into P32. The, 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 the comparison technique, I did not put it here because it requires a quite sophisticated Excel. Uh, um, I can refer you to the uh, uh, Wang PhD dissertations in 2005, how he calculate or how he convert the uh, P10 into P32. Uh, so the fracture driver is actually the 3D model of fracture abundance. Yeah? So once we get the P32 in the 3D grid, now it becomes a fracture driver. The, the fracture driver is our secondary property. It is our constraint in modeling the DFN in space. So it's like, if you understand the model, reservoir modeling, uh, when we model the, or when we try to- when we try to relate the um, uh, porosity and permeability, we, and we try to model the permeability, we use the porosity as the secondary variables. So the same case uh, happened here. So the distribution of the fracture uh, is constrained or guided by the fracture driver. The fracture driver is the P32 derived from the integrations of well data, uh, well intensity, uh, and also the seismic that we will discuss later on. So the fracture driver can be generated from the well data, yeah? from the structure. The, the structure here is, 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 is a geological concept. It means like a, uh, if you ever heard about the, the halo model, it's, a, it's a, 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 a geological concept that the fractures uh, develop along the, uh, or nearby the, the, the faults. There's, there's a weak zones nearby the, the faults that may uh, may fracture. Right? Or you can also use, if, it, if you have an uh, anticline form structures, it may uh, refers to the, uh, the distance to the fault hing. So in the, in the, the maximum curvature of the, the anticline or the hing, the, that's where the, the fracturing mostly occur. And uh, the lastly, uh, uh, the, the best one is the using the seismic data. So this is an example of the fracture driver and how we use, how we use them to uh, guide the, the, the distribution of the DFN. Yeah? In this case, uh, the properties inside is the, the, the interpreted uh, fracture driver with geological concept that the fracture uh, is developed along the fault hing. So, so this is the an, an, an anticline. Uh, this is the, 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 the truss faults. Yeah. And then the, 
using the 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 uh, the, 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 the well intensity uh, fracture uh, from well intensity uh, fracture intensity from well we we populate the fractures using the guides from this uh, uh, fracture driver so this is what it looks like so this is just uh, one example of the one fracture set with not west south east orientations distributed using a uh, fracture driver uh, derived from geological concept of fault heat. Now uh, the fracture driver from the seismic. <clears throat> um, there are many approach uh, or many methods that from seismic that can be used to identify the fractures. Um, of course the basic one is the seismic attributes. Yeah, the uh, the, 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 the structure attributes like a curvature, you can use a positive curvature or negative curvature, uh, coherence or variance map, uh, different software and name it differently, uh, and then uh, deep attributes and any other attributes that can uh, give information or give a clue of how the fracture distribution might be, like uh, entrack, chaos, and etc. Uh, if you go with a more advanced approach, as uh, this is especially uh, will be very good if you have a multi azimut seismic, you can go with the amplitude of uh, variation uh, versus uh, amplitude variation with offset uh, or angle or azimut. Um, like FUA and FES, or you can also play around with the velocity variance with azimut. And the last one is the, the zero wave splitting. So these are the, the more advanced methods. Uh, I cannot discuss it uh, into detail, but we will try to, to see some of them. Uh, this is the, the one examples of the, the seismic uh, curvature. So the seismic curvature can be in the form of the surface attributes or can be a 3D cubes. So this is what this uh, structure map looks like. The, uh, the, 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 the fault distributions. And then this is the, the seismic curvature. So they, uh, it behaves like the hello model. So the, the, the one that they, where we can see the, the, the high curvature is a death lock uh, around the well. Right? The second one is the, um, the coherence of variance. So here, the, the seismic data is converted into a volume of discontinuity so that we can see the faults, fractures, and also the stratigraphic variations. Uh, other attributes like uh, coherency, similarity, continuity, semblance are quite similar and can, can relate to, 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 to be used to, uh, to identify the fractures. I think this ad kind of attribute is very commonly used by geophysicists, so it's not the not the new things. But the Azimuda anisotropy requires uh, uh, special methods. Right? So uh, this is a very good um, approach. I mean, it's it's proven not only as a fracture detection, so, but we can also identify the fracture anisotropy or the orientation from the seismic uh, but it requires the analysis of the p uh, wave and s wave uh, altogether the the common methods for this is uh, the foa and the FAZ and also the velocity variation with azimuts and the zero wave splitting uh, I'm very sorry that I cannot explain it into detail as this is also not my specializations. Um, but there are plenty of uh, literature published in the, uh, in, the in, in the journals about the use of these methods in fracture detections. So the, if we derive the fracture driver from the seismic, uh, 
we 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 get the the factor driver from uh, correlations of the uh, seismic attributes and or inversions with the fracture intensity from well uh, and the a single seismic attributes may not satisfy the the correlations so we 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 tend to to use a multi attributes approach to 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 get a uh, statistically uh, good correlations with the well intensity. We, a common approach that uh, we use is like a neural network multivariate analysis, or you can also use the uh, machine learning if you if you have the tools. So this is just an example, simple examples. Yeah, I would say this is the simplest examples that we can get. Um, in when, when we, we try to convert the seismic attributes into uh, fracture drivers. Yeah. So let's say we have a seismic attributes. Let's say this is a, a variance or curvature, whatever it is. Uh, we try to find a correlation between the, the attributes and the fracture intensity from the well. Yeah. So it is shown by this cross plot. The correlation coefficient is then used to Build the fracture driver, in this case, the fracture intensity, using the collocated co rigging approach. So, once we have the, 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 the fracture drivers and all the inputs that we have discussed earlier the, the fracture aperture, the length, the width the orientations and the geometry. Yeah, we can generate the, 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 the fracture models with the guides from the, 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 the fracture driver. So in this examples, uh, it's different from the previous one where it was uh, controlled or constrained by the uh, geological concept where the fracture developed mostly at the fault hing. When we use the seismic data, it's uh, actually different. So the fractured area is actually high in the, in the south, slightly in the north. So when we populate the fractures, it will also follow this, uh, this trend. Now, um, once we get the fracture, uh, the DFN, to make it as, uh, uh, to be able to make it useful for the simulation, we need to uh, convert it into grids. Right? So we need to derive the fracture properties. Um, the fracture properties in these, uh, um, the during the conversions is calculated based on the, the fracture intensity of, uh, and the fracture aperture and also the fracture length, right? So for example, the porosity is calculated based on the aperture, calculated based on the intensity of the fracture in one grid cell mm -hmm. or each grid cell. Mm -hmm. Same goes to the probability, yeah? And also the sigma. Uh, sigma or set factors is the connection factor that define the connectivity of matrix and fractures. It describes how fluid flow between the matrix and fracture in dual medium reservoir. So this input is, uh, is, 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 is the input that required by the reservoir engineers when they want to run the, the dual medium simulations. Well, of course, these properties need to be uh, uh, updated. Uh, so the process of building the, the model is like a loop. So it's not stop when we when we, we, we when we upscale the, into the properties, then it's our job is finished. But due to the high uncertainty in the in the fracture modeling, it requires iterations between the, the, the geologists and the reservoir engineers to 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 obtain the, the optimum uh, fracture settings or fracture distributions in the model. So, <clears throat> so the fracture properties uh, are upscale. There are two common approach. 
One is the uh, order methods, and the second one is the tensor methods. The most common one and the oldest one is also is, is the order, order methods, and it's still uh, used until now. Um, there are some drawbacks, and uh, there has been a correction to it, to order methods. So let's see. The order method is a statistical based method. So, so it estimates the probability based on the total area of fractures in every cell. So regardless of the fracture connectivity, it's only take into account the how many fractures that we have in the cells. So the 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 the, the good side of this approach is the it's very fast and the result is uh, I mean mathematically it's good, but the the, the downside is that it does not account for the fracture connectivity. So we, if we use this uh, original order methods, uh, we potentially overestimate the probability. And another thing, it's very sensitive to cell size. So different cell size during the simulations will give you significantly different uh, uh, production profile during the history matching. So you need to take into account uh, 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 we need to do a uh, sensitivity on the cell size when we run the simulations with uh, its order methods. Um, the other method is tensor methods. It's a flow-based method that creates a finite element grid for itself and simulates flow under pressure gradients. So we can get the, uh, the probability at each uh, direction. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's different with uh, all the methods. In, in these tensor methods, it, it's already taken into account the, the connectivity. So the, the, the result is uh, pretty accurate. But the, the drawback is very, very slow. Yeah. Um, one note on the order method, there has been a, a correction to order methods that also include this connectivity. So some software already use this corrected order methods. So I mean, um, if we cannot, uh, if, if we cannot uh, use this tensor method because it's very slow, we can use the corrected met order method, which is also uh, quite good. Uh, this is just one of the snapshot examples of the how we upscale the the, the uh, to get the fracture properties. Yeah. So the 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 output of this upscaling process is that we will get a fracture porosity, we will get a sigma factor, we will get the fracture uh, permeability in three directions in i, j, and k. So we will get the these uh, properties. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, porosity, probability, and this is the intensity of the fracture driver that we use. So, so we can compare it uh, between the as a as a as a, a QC approach between the intensity, which is the secondary variables, compared to the porosity and the permeability. And the sigma. Um, uh, so, which one, which model to use? Uh, continuum fracture model or discrete fracture model? Uh, that's not really. I mean, it's it's pretty subjective. I mean, I I would recommend you to start with the the continuum fracture model first because it's very fast. I mean, once you work with the DFN or start working with the DFN, you will feel the pain in getting the fracture aperture, the fracture length, the width, and, 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 and fracture intensity from, from log interpretations. Um, so, so start with the continuum fracture model. The idea is to get the, to get the feeling of the, what's the, the permeability uh, required or which area with the uh, better productivity or lower productivity that may indicate the, the fracture distributions it's because later on we can also use this as the fracture driver right? so uh, before we jump into 
uh, DFN, I would suggest uh, yeah, people to use uh, CFM first because the, the, the time required to build CFM and DFM is very much different. So you, comp you are comparing uh, uh, one week work versus two months work. So um, I think um, that's what I, that's all the, 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 the slides that I have. Um, what I cover a lot in this presentation is focus on the modeling process. Uh, so we, we talk a lot, uh, we talk a lot about the, the, the refractor modeling. Uh, but the, the, the important aspect uh, where, they, where they most of the time, most of our time will be uh, spent is during the, the data gathering and data uh, interpretations. Um, especially if we use the, the uh, discrete fracture uh, DFN uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So um, that's all from, uh, from me. I, Pass back to uh, Afel for uh, if, if there's, there are some questions or the questions that I have an answer. Okay, thank you, Mas Suryadi. Very interesting uh, presentation. And now uh, we continue our discussion. Uh, some question is yet to be answered. Um, from Gede Wiryawan. Uh, Mas Yuryadi, based on your experience, drilling in fracture interval, do you prefer overbalanced or underbalanced drilling method? Um, I prefer drilling the underbalance, but the, the drillers prefer overbalance. So <laughs> we need to, well, we, we need to have a good discussion with that, uh, about that. And also uh, uh, the considerations on the geomechanical well. So, uh, especially if we have a uh, data acquisition span on uh, during the drilling, like uh, image logging. So, yeah, the, well, the key is the good communications uh, between the uh, subsurface and the driller team. Okay, prefer under balance, mm -hmm. but uh, if your driller uh, not agree with that, maybe near balance condition. Eh? <laughs> are there uh, okay from will done uh, question are there any classification for fracture value um, like that usually used in geotechnical investigation such as joint fracture numbers joint aperture uh, to produce number or numeric value for numerical modeling purpose of fractures uh, classifications. I'm not really sure if I understand the question properly, but they um, there's no classification like that. I mean, I mean, if there is no classification like saying that a one micron uh, aperture is small, uh, one to ten uh, micron is medium. Uh, there's no such classifications. Uh, especially the the trend right now. The, the modeling trend is the using a multi-scale uh, approach. So all skills are uh, included. We, we call it as an independent, scale independent uh, approach. Okay. Um, the other question uh, from Agung Budiarto. Agung Budiarto uh, has a question for you. Uh, regarding the correlation between fracture and rock type within single bed. Also, how your point of view of fracture behavior on fit flows between zones? Correlation between fracture and rock type as within single bed. Yeah, so I have I, I shown the uh, histogram like uh, of the uh, mythology versus the frequ fracture frequency, right? So there is uh, correlations between the, the fractures and rock types of mythology. So, uh, but it's not rock types like in um, our uh, modeling, uh, normal modeling. So the, it's, it's more toward the 
uh, use of rock times to identify the mechanical subgravity. Because the, uh, this, this uh, fracture modeling is uh, computation, computationally uh, expensive. So we need to do uh, a lot of uh, simplifications on that. So yeah, yeah. yes, there is a correlation between the uh, fracture and rock types, but it's not the rock types uh, as per uh, standard modeling. It's more toward the, uh, we need to group these uh, rock types. So rather than rock types, uh, there might be a correlation between these fractures and uh, depositional environments or to a, uh, like a, a sequence uh, in like in sequence in sequence stratigraphy um, to handle the flow between zones well that's yeah. the nature i mean if you interpret the nature uh, if we it depends on our data it depends on our interpretations so there's no uh, one answer for uh, for the questions okay Thank you, Mas. Uh, the next question from Sigit Ali. Based on your experience, what is the main cause when seismic attribute versus well data still not in good correlation at cross plot? Maybe uh, regarding to um, attribute for fracture model. Okay. Um, uh, yes, there's, uh, there's some uh, possible cause for that. Uh, one is the bias in the well data acquisitions. Yeah. So, the, uh, whether it is uh, the the the, and then also in the in the resolution between uh, well and the seismic, the, what we see from the wells might not be able to see from the seismic, right? That's uh, that's also happened in the in the, in the conventional reservoir modeling. Um, um, but the what, what, uh, but but we can do a simplifications like uh, trying to adjust or upscaling the the, the well information. Let's say we are talking about the fracture intensity from well versus the attributes that we think uh, has some relationship with the fracture intensity. Right. So try to increase the the the. The, the interval of observations or or or, or a like 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 cell thickness so maybe instead of doing it uh, meter by meter why don't you try to group it by every 10 meters by 20 meters by 30 meters and increase it until uh, there's a maybe there will, there will be a, a clue between the well and the seismic um another thing is that about the bias there's Yes, they, there's a bias in the, in the fractures. Uh, the, uh, well data is very much prone to bias, especially because it is not only controlled by the fracture distribution, but also by our well orientations. Mm -hmm. so, so that need to be taken into account. Uh, the third possibility is that the, we're comparing the P10 versus P32. So we're comparing measurements at one uh, D one dimensions from well with three dimension from the seismic. So, like I said before, we need to convert the P one zero into P three three two using uh, one one two thousand five uh, conversion factors. There are some uh, uh, a simple approach like multiply it by two, multiply it by three. But yeah, we can try it first. Okay. Okay, um, that's the answer and also the suggestion from um, from our speaker to Masigit Ari. Um, the next question was, if we have no seismic data like in geothermal, then which is the best way to model the fracture and how? Uh, then how to validate the model? Okay, in geothermal, we don't have seismic. Um, yeah. Maybe we have uh, um, other geophysic methods, right? So it's not only about the seismic. Even though I'm not uh, really experienced with the, the geothermal, but I know there are some uh, geophysical methods, like, uh, uh, for example, electromagnetic, to, mm -hmm. to 
uh, or, or uh, georadar that might give an indication of the diffractor distributions, right? So, or at worst, uh, it back to our geological, geological concepts, whether we, uh, how our interpretations on the uh, possible fracture distributions uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the subsurface. Um, in the geothermal, it's, I mean, we can use uh, the, the, the satellite image or uh, from the Google Earth to, to identify the linemen or the possible uh, faultings and relate that with the, uh, all these uh, surface features of uh, the hydrothermal. I think uh, that's all that I can answer. Back to okay. the geology. The, the point is back to the geology. Back to geology, okay. And how to validate the model, Mas? Uh, is it related with the geothermal or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, still in the same question. You need to drill it. You need okay. to do the simulations. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, data will answer and validate the model. Um, the next question from Anas Hanafia. Uh, he has uh, two questions. The first one is how to def how we define critical stress analysis for opening fracture in volcanic case while not complete with Eaton or Bauer's concept. Uh, can you repeat the question? It's a bit... uh, how we define critical stress analysis for opening fracture in volcanic case. Define the critical stress analysis. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit out of the topic because it's uh, the geomechanical uh, domain to do that. Um, so I'm not a geomechanical expert to, to answer. Okay. Very sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, the second question is uh, quite related with our topic. How, com how confident if we using INN or artificial neural network for define fracture characterization in volcanic related with uh, okay with with his first question <laughs> how confident uh, if you're using INN for defining fracture characterization in volcanic mass okay so that one is okay um any method not only the neural networks um, requires uh, validations right so mm -hmm. how can confidence are we it depends on the how good the validations of the the, the model that we produce uh, the problem is that if we do not have the data or the tools to, to do the verifications, uh, then we, we can only rely on the, 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 the analog uh, from the, uh, our neighbors or from the, the published literature. But if we have, then a verification is the, the, the best way. Uh, like in geothermal, we drill a lot of wells, right? We also have logs. Can we, can we take some of the logs and use them as the, the blind well test? And if we have a, 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 a we, we also do the uh, water uh, simulations, right? So can we use the, the simulations or the uh, production data to, to, to validate the, the, the model? Uh, that's the questions or the possible uh, solutions that can be can be can be done mm. okay thank you mas um the next question from leo coco um the question is back to the result of discrete fracture network uh, that previously displayed on your slide uh, he's seen that at least three or four cluster uh, which believe derived from collocated co rigging from seismic attribute, probably and tracking. I saw those three or four cluster are not connected. My question are, the first one, are the wells showing connected or not connected pressure? Then the FN can be used. To mm -hmm. Is that question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is the, the first question first. Yeah. So, don't take what I presented here as uh, as it is. I mean, this is for a demonstration purpose only. But uh, uh, and this is taken from the uh, open data in the mm. US, so it's not a real samples. Uh, 
so actually, I do not know the answer. I don't know whether the wells are in communications or not. Yeah, but uh, if we have similar problem in our reservoirs, the, the answer it depends on our uh, data. So that's why the data acquisitions, uh, data analysis is very important. Um, the production data or well test data is is, is the ultimate uh, uh, validator for the, the the model. So we can uh, validate the, the 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 model using the, uh, the the static descriptions or using the blind well test, but. At the end of the day, it's the production data that de decide whether our model is uh, uh, is good or not. Okay. Thank you, Mas, uh, for the answer. Uh, the next question from Lutfi: How you can determine of the drill dry direction type, such as vertical or uh, deviated drilling, regarding your data? All right. So. If I can show you the seismic, maybe. All right, this one is good. So how do we drill the the well? What is the well trajectory? So yes. it depends, it really depends on the fracture orientations, right? So like this examples, the fracture orientation is like this, uh, dipping to the right, and the other one is a little bit vertical, and another one is dipping to the left. Right? So why this well drill vertically? By drilling this well vertically, they can intersect well, uh, two kind of fractures. One is the one that dipping to the left, and the other one is the one that dipping to the to the right. Why they don't drill horizontal well? Maybe they did. Uh, so, but if they did that, they can only penetrate the zone one zone only. Like like say they, if they drill horizontal well, maybe they can only get a zone one, uh, or maybe just a zone two. So that's considerations is uh, based on uh, whether we will drill uh, vertical or slanted and at what angle or at what azimuth, it depends on the fracture orientations and what is the objective of uh, our drilling. Do we want to intersect as many fractures as possible or do we want to avoid the fractures? So it's not always that the, I mean, it, 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 it depends on the objective. If you want to drill as many fractures as possible, the best way uh, in this example is to drill a high angle wells. Right? Mm -hmm. So we can drill it from here, high angle to there. So we can intersect these zones and that zones, or from, from left to right, uh, instead of verticals. But there might be another considerations. If we, they want to avoid the fractures, like in uh, carbon examples, they want to avoid the fractures, for example, because if they drill through the fractures, they will get early water breakthrough. So they need to place the well away from the fractures. So uh, it really depends on the, the on the on the objective. Okay. Thank you, Mas. Um, another question from Leo Coco. What is your suggestion for fracture driven to be used in the basement? Since there are no seismic attribute can be calculated in chaotic inside the basement. Okay, so um, fractured basement and the seismic yep. does not help. Yes. So how do we know that the fracture is uh, the basement is fractured? So that's one question that we need to ask ourselves, right? So yep. um, Actually, it backs to data. The, the lesser the data that we have, the, the higher the uncertainty that we will face. Um, if it is possible to acquire new seismic with better quality or reprocess the seismic with better uh, technique, because the, 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 the processing technology today is, 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 is extremely, I mean, I mean, it's really, really good compared to uh, the technology 10, 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> if we already have the well data, can we analyze the well data? Um, so if we have an analog uh, from the uh, offset or fields or from our neighbor, can we use those uh, as the, the analog? So there are lots of a uh, approach to do that. But uh, it's back to the, the, the basic uh, concept is that 
the lesser the data that we have, the higher the uncertainty that we will face. So get more data, and meanwhile, uh, can you, we can use the, the, the analog from the offset fields. Okay. Um, thank you for the answer, Pak. Um, the next question uh, for, from Firman Herdiansia. Could you give me insight in fault-related fracture, fracture in the back limb area, uh, far from fault hinge, having connectivity better than in fore limb area? Is it normal? It's not normal, but they, it happens. So, um, um, the, the explanation for it is that the, 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 the folding process, it's not happen from, uh, I mean, it's the, the, the previous, the, the, the deformations that occurred at the limb, at the, 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 the back limb, is, 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 is uh, structurally very much similar to what happened in the, in, in the fourth hing or in the four limbs. So um, it's quite difficult to explain it, but there is a, there is one publication about that in the, I don't remember, maybe in the APG or something, that they, that they observed that the, 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 the limb area, especially the back limb area, is uh, more uh, fractured compared to the, the, the fault hing or the, the, the fore limb. The, 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 the cause is because they actually, the, 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 the folding process itself is translated or or started with the, the back limb and it's ended with the, the, the what currently now as the the fourth thing on the, the, the fourth limb so previously the, the back limb was folded as well but now it becomes uh, the back limb because of the uh, the, the, the present day hing is what def, what 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 define the structure shape right, right today so trying to find that uh, I don't remember which uh, what, what what's the, the the paper title and the 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 author, but there is one I read that once. Okay, well it's a rare case, but it happens. Okay, thank you, Mas. Um, uh, the next question from Baur Rega. When I uh, when I integrate the DFN model on grid geological, are there the impact on volume calculation? Uh, the volume, the fracture, uh, the volume or the porosity from fracture is very, very small. So the fracture porosity is usually range between one to four uh, percent. Sometimes uh, the median is only like one or two percent. So it's very, very small. So the impact on the, the volumetric is very small if you have a dual medium, unless uh, the fracture is your uh, the storage, so yes, you will get additional uh, volumes. But if you have a dual medium for matrix and fractures, the additional volumes from the fracture is very small. Okay, that's the answer. And uh, if there are any question from other participant, please uh, type on the chat column. Then we will discuss it with uh, Masurya. Uh, I have a question, Mas. Um, yes, yes. Some some areas rarely have image log uh, data in, in in this area. Um, should we make a fracture properties model, uh, or just we only use a seismic attribute by qualitative approach for? Uh, for targeting fracture target. All right, so, we, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I explained it that, uh, before that the, it, it's actually it's really, really helpful. I mean, it's not, maybe we don't have the, um, we don't have the, the proper data to, to, mm -hmm. to, to build the fracture model, but the, yeah. some people, is, uh, I mean, when we try to explain it to our colleague, 
maybe we are as the uh, the subsurface team who do, who do the study understand the, the right fracture distributions but the, the the point of visualizations by showing them that we have fracture here and there uh, it's it's i mean it's very very beneficial especially when we when we talk to our drilling colleague when they when we want to design a well so um and and it's also help us i mean the visualization is a, is a, like is, is, a, is a key when we design the well so back to the previous questions like whether we want to intersect as many fractures as possible or we want to avoid the fractures when we can uh, visualize the, the fractures into our model then we can have better understanding of where we want to place the well so this is not only about the uh, drill the well for development purpose but also for the exploration so uh, for data acquisition purpose so yes i would suggest you to build the model um, not the sophisticated one maybe a simple one a quick dfn only to 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 give you a guidance when you want to design a well and make a data acquisition planning and it's also very beneficial when you want to discuss it to with, with, with the other team right right thank you mas um the question from dian kurniawan mas suryadi based on your experience what is the most sensitive parameter in fracture is that aperture length spacing that has big impact in fluid flow uh the fluid flow uh, it's permeability so the permeability formula it's calculated based on the aperture and the spacing intensity fracture intensity okay it goes towards the most, most important um but the um of course length also because the um the the the, the fracture length in each cell will be used as the uh, as one of the, the the input in the equations so aperture length and then intensity okay and the second question from dian what is the best completion type for fracture reservoir what is the best completion types when yeah. you're asking to the wrong guy i'm not a completion engineer <laughs> <laughs> but they, but they, um if you want to produce it um well it depends on the reservoir right whether you have a fine migrations or not maybe open hole maybe open hole with sand screens or something like that i mean it's it really depends on your reservoir that one answer cannot cannot satisfy every every, every case right. okay i think this is the last question masuria okay uh, from this is is upscaling more of a geologist role or it is an engineer's role upscaling of the fractures it's still a geologist role but it's very easy so anyone can do it but the the point is not whose role is this but what are we going to do or how we validate the the the, the, the results so um, once it is upscaled whether it is done by geologists or it is done by re um, it's less, it doesn't matter what matter is uh, can it satisfy the, the the validations from the production data? Can it can we get the, the the history match? Can we match the the permeability from the production test? Uh, things like that. Because the process, uh, the modeling process is supposed to be iterative process. So uh, it's not a a, a linear process. Uh, once we we and uh, once we reach the upscaling and get the properties, it should be validated, and if it is it doesn't match or doesn't satisfy the, the, the dynamic data, we need to the, the 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 earlier steps. So it's like a loop. Okay, uh, Mas, <laughs> there is still two question. Uh, no if you have some times to answer this question, no, can yeah. we continue? Okay. Yeah. Um, from Alam Shah, uh, which workflow do you think is best for fracture basement modeling? Is that CFN or DFN? Uh, let's use both of them. All right. both. So, yeah, because it's like this. This CFM, if you do it properly, uh, DFN, sorry, DFN, if you do it properly, 
you do it carefully. Um, you may need two months. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to CFM, because uh, you may only need like uh, one week, two weeks. So imagine that the time difference. And uh, so I would suggest everyone to start with the CFM. The CFM results can be, uh, can, uh, I mean, if we insist to use the DFM, because they, we want to, uh, to have a realistic geological model. The, the output of the CFM is, one of them is the intensity model. The intensity model is the fracture drivers. It is one input in the DFM. So it's not a waste of time because the, with the CFM, if we start with the CFM, we end up with the, the intensity model uh, other than properties. The properties we can pass it to the reservoir engineers for doing uh, some tests, while the intensity can be used later on for the, the, the DFN. And meanwhile, the reservoir engineers busy with the, the simulations. We can proceed with the, the fracture analysis on the aperture, on the length, on the uh, dividing fracture into sets, and so on. Okay. Thank you, Mas. Um, from Pak Gede Wirawan, one way is to identify whether or not fracture open or not is by sonic stone lee for uncalibrated permeability. Have you ever run it? If yes, what do you say? Uh, yes, uh, but the, the answer is no, I have never run those things, um, never use it. Uh, but there are uh, people using using that the 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 the, the stonely the sonic stonely um so i cannot answer it uh properly but i prefer to use the uh, image lock because that uh, can be observed uh, directly mm, okay maybe if uh, you have more budget you can uh, add the sonic stonely yeah. for improving your uh, data quality mas mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, I think um, that's all. All the question, uh, Masuri Adias answer for for us. Really interesting presentation. Uh, before we close the presentation, Masuri Adi, maybe you have uh, some other closing statement for the audience. Uh, not much. Uh, just uh, very much. Thank you very much uh, for uh, participating in these uh, presentations. Um, uh, Thank you for bearing with me in the last two and a half hours. Uh, a lot of good questions. I hope that we can uh, have another session uh, with uh, more uh, other materials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Masuri Adi. And also, uh, just to remind the audience, uh, please fill the evaluation form from ISPG webinar session. The link uh, is on your chat column. Uh, so uh, I, I also thank to all the audience, all the uh, participants, and also Mark Suryadi. Uh, so I close the session and I pass to the president of ISPG, Mas Julianta. Thanks, Mas Afel, uh, for leading the discussion. And Mas Suryadi, thanks for the uh, good sharing today. So again, on, on behalf of ISPG, I would like to express a gratitude to all participants today. Hopefully we can continue all these kinds of things. And before we left, I think we can open all the videos so we can take picture together. Okay. Mas Afel and Mas Fasno, maybe you can helping to. Oh, okay. 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 Screenshot. Please that. open the video to all participants. Yeah.
Oke, Mas Abel. Oke. Oke. So, stay tuned on the ISPG YouTube channel and all the social media that we have in LinkedIn, in Instagram, Facebook, and we'll upload this uh, video later on. Okay, see you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend.